Last week I began with the, song, the words of a song from the 60s. Well, this, this week it's the 70s. Um, don't believe me if I tell you. Not a word of this is true. Don't believe me if I tell you. Especially if I tell you I'm in love with you. Don't believe me if I tell you that I wrote this song for you. There just might be some other silly pretty girl I'm singing to. Don't believe a word. Words are only spoken. But your heart is like a promise made to be broken. Don't believe a word. Words can tell lies and lies are no company when there's tears in your eyes. Don't believe me if I tell you not a word of this is true. Don't believe me if I tell you, especially if I tell you I'm in love with you. Don't believe a word. No, don't believe a word. The singer was Phil Lynott. The group was Tin Lizzy. Uh, they're from Dublin and I have a special affection uh, for them for no particular reason. Um, but his words uh, could have been written for today. There's so much misinformation going around. There's so many people willing to speak to us face to face or to speak to the camera and to broadcast to the nation things which, to be honest, they know are not true. It seems fashionable and it seems okay just to say anything you like. Reminds me of when I was little. You know, and you've done something wrong. Not that I, of course, ever did anything wrong. Um, I'm going to remember facing my mother and, and making the mistake of saying, no, no, it wasn't me. I didn't do that. And her looking at me and me thinking, no, she doesn't believe me. But we grow up and we should learn to speak the truth. We should learn that when we tell lies, we get found out. But actually, as John writes to the church, he's writing to encourage them, but he's a little, just that little bit worried about them. He's a little bit worried that they might believe some things which are not true because others are coming in to try and confuse them and push them around and take them away from the truth. And so we come to this. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. It's always been this way. It was that way in the Old Testament. In fact, God talked to his people about what they should do with false prophets. Uh, it, it wasn't very nice. The false prophets were around in, in Jesus' time. And they were around in the time of the early church. They came and they tried to bring God's people away from the truth. To, to sideline them, to take them off on another path. And away from the truth of the gospel, from the good news that Jesus came to bring. And John says, don't believe, basically he's saying, as Phil Lynott said, don't believe in everything you hear. Test it, think about it, wonder about it. Sometimes when people experience something spiritual for the first time, they can be drawn into believe what people are saying, whether the thing is true or not. Sometimes... There are spiritual forces out there that do things that seem marvellous and wonderful and people follow them. Some follow them because they feel they can talk to their dead relatives. Some follow them because they feel they can find some sort of cure for the terrible feelings that they have about themselves and the guilt that they have. But when people come, they don't always lead them to Christ, to the cross, to an acknowledgement of our sin and the forgiveness that comes from God. And John says, don't believe every spirit, but test it. Sometimes, when we watch Christians on TV, they can say things that are not true. Say things that are just that little bit, you know, like the preachers who say, I need a private jet in order to do God's work. The fact that it costs $20 million is irrelevant. And something in me, 
something in me just strikes against that. As we read of a saviour who had nowhere to place his head and yet turned the world upside down. It's a saviour who took a few crusts and a few fish and fed 5,000. There was no need of a private jet. Well, they didn't exist. But he didn't need a private jet. But he didn't have that kind of thing. He didn't need it. So how do we discern it? How do we test these things out? Well, John says, this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. You see... The particular problem they were having back in, in that day was that there were preachers around, there were teachers around who were kind of on the, on the edges of the Christian church who were saying that Jesus, yes, Jesus was God, but he'd come as a kind of disembodied spirit. He wasn't really one of us. He didn't come as a real person. They said that any, anyone who was truly God couldn't um, take on real flesh because the flesh is, is evil and wrong. And uh, Jesus wouldn't do that. And yet the clear teaching of Scripture was that he had. The clear teaching of Scripture was that he, he was one of us, that he was born of Mary, that he grew up as a child, and then lived among us as one of us. And that's the clear teaching of the apostles, of the Gospels, and of the letters that came, that came since. But people had their own ideas. And that's the clue to testing the spirits. Sometimes the Christian church or those within the Christian church have had their own ideas and say things like, surely God wouldn't do this or would do that. But it bears no relation to what the Bible actually says. It's, it's, it's their own idea of who God is. It's their own idea of who Jesus is. I've come across that down through the years. People maybe just on the edge of the church. People who, who have a kind of faith. But, but their idea of the Christian faith and the, the Christian life um, is at odds with what the Bible teaches. Um, they, they have their own ideas about, about what Christians and what a Christian life is. And it, it marries very carefully with how they think the world should be. So down through the years, there were Christians, for instance, who were against people like William Wilberforce and John Newton, who, who actually campaigned to stop slavery. There were Christians who said, oh, no, slavery's all right. It's fine. Well, because they owned slaves or because they made profit out of slaves. And down through the years, there have been all kinds of things like this. And one in the church itself was that there was the idea, it led to the Reformation, the idea that if you did, if you'd done something wrong, um, you could buy what was called an indulgence. You could pay some money to the church, and they would give you an indulgence. And that would uh, cure all else, and it would forgive your sins. And there was a man, and in fact, uh, Martin Luther got very annoyed at him, and the Reformation came because of it. There was a man who used to go around Germany saying, in German, but um, um, saying that every time a coin uh, drops uh, or in the, in the um, uh, offering clings, another soul from purgatory springs. Um, it doesn't rhyme quite as well or play quite as well in English as it did in German. But basically the teaching was you could buy your way into heaven. And more importantly, you could buy your way into heaven for those relatives who'd already died. Uh, Luther, strangely enough, didn't like that and thought it didn't really um, go along with what the Bible says. And, well, the rest is history in the sense that the Reformation happened um, because of stuff like that. But it was clearly against what the Scripture said, but it brought money and it brought finance <coughs> into the church. So this is how you recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that recognizes that Jesus has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. Basically, it's all about him. It's not about the church, whether it's a small church like this or our sister church in Desperate, or a large church packed to the rafters. It's not about the preacher. 
It's not about the church. It's not about the organization. It's not about the rules and the regulations. It's about Jesus. And if our focus isn't on him, and if our trust isn't on him, and if we don't acknowledge him who is the one who is, as, as the one who is Lord of all and the one who is in charge, then there is something wrong. I don't know if you've experienced this, but I, I've been in churches as a minister and, and as a member of the congregation where certain families ruled the roost, where there were people who were in charge and uh, they weren't necessarily in the leadership, but they were still in charge and everything had to sort of be passed by them. It wasn't a written rule, but it was one of those unwritten rules. Well, you know, that's a very sad day for any church. Because he's the one who's in charge. We need to acknowledge him. And he's not only the one who's in charge, but he is the one who has put things right by his death on the cross. He is the one who brings salvation. He is the one who does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And these people, um, and people down in the century since, these people who, who couldn't take on that he was truly human and truly come in the flesh were pushing Jesus to one side and were bringing their own teaching and their own leadership to the fore. Anyone who pushes Jesus to one side shouldn't be listened to. Anyone who says, oh, well, Jesus might have said that, but... When I was at theological college, and that was a long time ago now, um, we had a, a principal called Ivor Oakley. We used to call him Ivor the Engine. He was Welsh, and um, he reminded us of uh, Ivor the Engine. He was quite, quite a small man. Um, but he also taught New Testament. And I still remember the smile on his face, the beam on his face, when he talked about the New Testament and when he talked about Jesus. And the phrase that he used, and he used it quite a few times, that, well, it shows because I've remembered it. He said, if you're ever unsure, if you ever don't know something, and you want to know what really matters, he said, go back to the Gospels. Go back to Jesus. Ask yourself, has Jesus anything to say about this? And he was particularly, at one point, talking about the second coming, and he, and he was saying, don't go into Revelation, because that's, that's hard to understand. He, he was a New Testament scholar. He said, don't go into the prophetic words. Go to Jesus. Begin there with the clarity and the authority of what Jesus has to say. You know, it's a, it's a good rule of life. If you're not sure, go back to Jesus. If you're not sure of your salvation, go back to Jesus and see what he has done and what he has said and what he has taught. If you're not sure about something else, go back to Jesus. He says, so anyone who puts Jesus aside is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. So what he's saying is, watch out. Watch out for what people say. Weigh what they say. Weigh what your minister says. Uh, yeah, I mean me. Yeah. <laughs> if I say something that seems to you just not scriptural, then challenge me about that. I know that's hard to challenge people, but or ask the question. I mean, be nice, obviously. I know you would be, but but talk about it and say, look, I don't understand. You've said something here. It doesn't seem to fit in with what the Bible says on this. Too often churches go wrong because we just accept what someone standing in the pulpit says. Let's find out these things for ourselves. But he doesn't want them to be afraid. And, and all through this, um, through this uh, book of 1 John, he's been telling them things that are, are difficult. He's been warning them about stuff, but he doesn't want them to be afraid. He doesn't want them to get into a sort of tailspin and worry about stuff. And so he says in verse 4, um, which I've got there, And now you, dear children, are from God and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. In other words, the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of God, working and living in you is greater than that which is out there. Sometimes I think the church um, 
doesn't think enough, for instance, about the second coming of Christ. But sometimes the church gets obsessed with the second coming to the point where we forget about what's going on here. Sometimes we get obsessed with what's going on in the world and that is it the sign of the times and get worried about what's going on. No, he says, you are for God and have overcome one because you, the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Whatever you see going on in the world around you, whatever you see happening to the church or in the church, don't go into a tailspin of worry and concern because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is out there causing problems and causing difficulties and, and pushing things around. God is greater than the one who opposes him. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. We are from God and whoever knows God listens to us. But whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. Have you ever met someone in a church who just won't listen? Has their own ideas about things? And just won't listen. Be wary. Be wary of that. Be wary of the one who doesn't listen. Because as brothers and sisters, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we need to listen to each other. And we will listen to each other. Because you know what? None of us are always right. I don't know what you're like about... Um, I was going to call them discussions, but let's call them arguments. I don't know what you're like when there's an argument, whether it's you know, with a spouse or with a brother or sister or, or a, a parent or someone within the church. I, I don't know what your reaction to those sort of situations are. But as brothers and sisters in the church, John is saying that we need to be confident that, that God's spirit put within us God's spirit with, put within us is greater than any spirit that there is out in the world. And that people should listen to us because we have that spirit within us. But also, actually, the reverse is true. We should listen to those who have God's spirit within them. How often do churches break up and fall apart? Not over great theological teachings. But over uh, whether we should have pews or chairs, whether we should sing modern songs or old songs, whether we should have the organ or the piano. I was in a church once where a man um, walked up the drive, heard a guitar playing in the church before the service and walked out, turned around, walked and went home. Um, because, of course, guitars are, are not allowed, whereas organs are mentioned many times in the Bible. Um, and when I talked to him, to begin with, wasn't really willing to listen because he had his own thoughts and his own ideas. The ideas that we have in our heads, the thoughts and the feelings that we have in our hearts should be the ones put there by the Spirit of God. And we listen to those around us recognising that fact too. He says that uh, people who are from the world get listened to by the world. Now, I mean, it's wonderful when the, the world does listen to the church, when people hear the gospel, when they, when they put their lives into God's hands and, and they become, become one of his children. But sometimes the world has listened to the church down through the years because the church has said what the world wants to hear. And you know, as, as Christians, we need to be wary of that. We need to be wary of saying to the world outside, of saying to people around us, the things we think they want to be here to hear. Sometimes we need to be willing to say the things that they don't want to hear. Because that's what the scripture tells us. I knew a woman when we lived in Cambridgeshire who had quite an argument with our local vicar. Um, and then began to talk to us about it and how he wouldn't listen and, you know, it was terrible. And, um, 
And I said, well, what's up? What's he been saying? She says, well, she said, he says that if I want my sins forgiven, I need to ask God for forgiveness. And because of what Christ has done on the cross, my sins can be forgiven. And I remember saying to her something like, and, and, and what's the problem with that? <laughs> I said, well, I don't want Jesus to pay the price for my sins. I want to put things right. I want to pay the price for my sins. And as gently as I could, I told her that uh, Father Graham was right and that she was wrong. But she couldn't get it. She couldn't understand it. She couldn't see that it's Jesus who is the one who makes the difference. And so, John says, test everything. Test all that you hear and all that you see and all that you understand, even if it's a Christian telling you that, particularly perhaps if it's someone who seems to be a Christian. Ask yourself, are they acknowledging Jesus? Are they putting Jesus at the center of everything, what he said and what he did? And are we? And as we look at a broken world, a world that's full of problems and a world that's full of people who are, who are going wrong, we need to remember that the one who is in us is greater than the one who is, the, is in the world. That you're, you and I are not right because we are or because we're clever or because we're spiritual. But we're right because of what God has done for us and the spirit that God has put in us as we put our lives into his hands. Let's pray.